Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to episode 101 of the MK Productions podcast. I'm your host, Mac, joined here as usual by my co host, Kristen. Kristen, sorry to the people that are listening to this podcast right now. Happy 101 Dalmatians. I mean, 101 episodes. I'm going to give that joke a six out of 10. I would not recommend telling that again. But yes, we're back. It's been a minute. Like, at this recording, it's been a month since we already recorded it because we had a big episode. It was our big 100th episode. We had, that like, was a, a long of... episode. Yeah, yeah, it was almost, what was that? Almost three hours, pretty much, like a three hour episode. And that that's was... the first podcast I ever listened to after I edited it because I listen, I don't usually listen to the podcast except you for editing don't? it. No, I hate the sound of my own voice, but I listened to it and I was. That's like Johnny Depp. He doesn't like watching his own movies because he doesn't like watching himself or like the sound of his own voice. Well, it's like your skull has a different frequency to what your voice sounds like. So that's kind of like how I feel about it. But I listened to it and we had a lot of people, we got a lot of new fans are listening because a lot of the guests, yeah, a lot of the guests, uh, they passed it on. Everyone said they're watching, they're loving it. It's currently sitting at 16 views on Spotify and it's currently sitting at 22 views on YouTube. So it did pretty well. Oh, well, welcome everyone to new viewers. And to anybody who is joining, and it's so nice to have your beautiful, lovely listening ears. Yeah, so it's been a minute since we've been here, so you got to remember how we do this. But usually how these shows go is that we're going to give us our intro right here, what we're doing. Then we're going to switch on over to some movie news, which there's a lot of news, like holy hell. And we're going to be talking about Scream 6 hey. going over um, some of our favorite movies that we've seen since this is about to be April. It is April, near the end of April and we're about to hit May in uh, this recording. So we're going to talk about our top five movies of the year we've seen so far because let's face it, we see a lot of shit and we may or may not talk about all of it, but we, we try to talk about it all. Not in depth, we'll just cover, we're just going to give you the basis of maybe what to watch. And Yes, we are. Let's get right into the news, shall we? You got to do the emphasis. Right into the news. Into the news. There we go. This is CNN. Mac, my good sir, why don't you start us off with our first piece of news? All right, so first news stop. Might as well get this out of the way. Jonathan Majors, uh, known for his roles in Iron Man and the Lost Quantum Medium and Creed 3, has been in a boatload of legal trouble since March late March last year when he was arrested on March 23rd for domestic assault on his girlfriend or a unnamed woman. And he was arrested and charged with multiple counts of assault. And with that, he is facing a court date of May 8th for those charges. But as of today, um, an X amount of women, we don't know how many numbers, are more alleged abuse victims are cooperating with the Manhattan DA's office. So this is from Variety.com. Um, and also, this goes along with Jonathan Majors was dropped from his PR and uh, management team. Uh, so, yep, what happened? Sources familiar, sources familiar with the matter tell Variety that multiple alleged abuse victims of Majors have come forward following his March arrest and are cooperating with the Manhattan Manhattan's district attorney's office. The prospect of more women waiting in the wings who would mark a dramatic turn in the case that comes on the heels of Majors' publicist and management for cutting ties with the embattled actor earlier this week. Um, so, yep. He was arrested on March 25th in the Chelsea neighborhood of Manhattan on charges of strangulation, assault, and harassment. Um, New York PD spokesperson said in a statement that a 30-year-old woman told police she had been assaulted by Majors 33 and that she sustained minor injuries to their head and neck and was removed to an area hospital in stable condition. And um, the mounted an immediate aggressive response, insisting that the actor, his, um, his uh, uh, lawyer, is prob- probably is probably the victim of an altercation between with a woman he knows and, just, and suggested that the woman was having a uh, um, uh, emotional crisis. Just as, uh, going along with the story is that he's been cut from a few different projects. So uh, first project would be a U.S. Army ad that has recently aired, but they are taking that down immediately. Uh, he did a commercial with the um, MLB's Texas Rangers, which has been cut. He's been dropped from, um, I think, a movie. What is it called? Uh, the Man in My Basement. Um, and then he was going to be in the Otis Redding uh, biopic project. And uh, yeah, so, uh, but he has one movie. He is still um, slated to appear in Loki season two, although there has been rumors that 
that Marvel's looking to recast it with maybe Jonathan Boyega, John Boyega playing Kang. And um, he still has uh, magazine dreams coming out later this year. So, uh, Kristen, what do you think about all this? He is not doing well at the moment. But this man, oh gosh, the, I've never seen something go up high so well. Like he's on this great roller coaster. He's going all the way up and now he's just going down. Like they're at like a hundred miles per hour and it's all about to come to a crashing halt. And he's going to be like, well, there goes my career, but not saying that maybe everything will get cleared up and he might be able to start acting hopefully again, but you know, we don't support any toxic behavior or stuff here. I don't support it. And uh, it's sad to hear because this man had a huge career. He's a fantastic actor. If he, he's a fantastic just, actor. If it turns out he's a piece of shit, then fuck him. Yeah, uh, that's this is this, really, really sad to hear because I really enjoyed like all the projects he had been attached to like upcoming and what he previously had done um and it, it, it's just not good it really isn't and knowing that we're going to get a quick replacement for uh and... kang is just astonishing to me because then you know this makes me think about like the other actors who got away with this abusive behavior and are not you know the other studios aren't taking action uh um, Warner Brothers, uh, Ezra Miller, but uh, we won't go there. So, Mac, your thoughts? Well, it's obviously just sad because at first, when I heard the reports, I said, "Okay, wait, there's no way," because this, this happened on Saturday morning in the evening. I was like, "Oh, that's they would have said that in the morning," but no, it came out and it broke hard. And at first, I was like, "Okay, you know, let's let's see all the details what happened." Uh, and then uh, uh, the week after, uh, his attorneys released text messages, which. Uh, does not paint him in the right light, and I will read these text messages. This was between him and the alleged, um, and the, the and the victim. So, mm -hmm. uh, this is from Saturday, the Nevada happened. Uh, so he texts, "Did you leave the keys? Goodbye." And then it's redacted. And then at six o'clock that day, please, ne this is the um, the girl. Please let me know you're okay when you get this. They assured me that you won't be charged. They said that they had to arrest you as protocol when they saw the injuries on me and they knew we had a fight. I'm so angry that they did, and I'm sorry you're in this position. We'll make sure nothing happens about this. I told them it was my fault for trying to grab your phone. I only just got it out of the hospital. Just call me when you're out. I love you. you three and a half hours later. They just called again to check on me, and I reiterated how this was not an attack and they do not have the blessings and any charges being placed. I read the paper they gave me about strangulation, and I said point blank that that this this did not occur and should be removed immediately. The judge is definitely going to be told this. She assured this to me. I know you have the best team and there's nothing to worry about. I just want you to know that I'm doing all I can on my end. I also said to tell the judge to know that the origin of the call was to do with me collapsing and passing out and your worry as my partner due to our communication prior. Out of care, she promised all be relayed. So what his team thought was like, yeah, no, Jonathan didn't do any bad, but Clearly, if you are a psychology major or any criminal majors, this could be seen as signs of e emotional abuse. To emotional me, like, abuse, mm. you definitely. Because it's definitely. like, she's like, she's like, no, I promise. No, I, I told him not to do charges or anything. So this is like, it's not, it doesn't, it didn't paint him in the right light. This is a, these are signs of a very bad, toxic relationship in person. And mm. Girl, you got to get out. That's not how a man should be treating you. You shouldn't have to be an apology. You shouldn't be apologizing, girl. No. But I hope you have a good support group to get through the stuff you need because Jonathan Major sounds like not the best boyfriend or so partner my, right now. Let me ask you this. So May 8th is coming around the corner at time of recording. And he's, this is probably going to be a very public uh, hearing because this is like, you know, he is an Ant-Man. He mm -hmm. did Creed 3. He's supposed to appear in Loki. And he's going to be in Magazine Dreams. If this ends up being uh, proven that there are signs of abuse and everything, do you think his career is over? Or if he's proven innocent, will he be able to get his career back on track? Or will that stigma kind of do something to der derail it for where it was going? Um, he, was, he was in the talks for like, because like, I remember you guys said like, oh, magazine, that's going to be uh -huh. an Oscar film. He might be on. So does that change everything knowing that 
that movie's already done and it's gonna hit the the film circuit probably in the summer and will that uh, will well, that change now it's kind of, well magazine dreams they announced it's gonna come out in december uh-huh. so searchlight bought the film who knows they might decide to put the film on hold and might have to go the streaming route just to make sure they get the money's worth out of it but i think if he is proven guilty of these crimes we're just going to see him drop like flies so no more, all so... these projects we're going to basically see the same way we saw johnny jet being dropped from like pirates from uh all these other roles and now he's getting the roles again but the it's just is... gonna he's gonna lose everything so question... that he has right now the question is if, if you're marvel and this is proven that he did these things how would you handle Kang since he was set up, he's set up to be the new big bad? The, do you think about recasting or try to get someone a different actor or recasting or maybe just write a new villain entirely? Well, so if they were to recast, I feel like that's okay. And I've heard a front runner, it is a front runner right now is John Boyega. I've heard, and I would love that. I and mean, I, I think he deserves something after uh, Star Wars. The man has been in a lot of like independent films lately. And it would be great to see him go back into like a blockbuster spotlight. Mm -hmm. So I think he would be an outstanding casting choice. I saw somebody like mention that they would like to see Lakeith Stanfield, but I don't. I don't think that could work. I don't think I can see him in the MCU, but not as a villain. Yeah. He seems like something that he seems to be like Dr. Strange or like uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. I could see him definitely in like a Guardians of the Galaxy, but uh, yeah. but a but, spinoff of Guardians because you now uh, that film wraps yeah. out. But maybe but, else in, in the universe, I would love to see it. You know, like Keith Stanfield and get John you know. get John Boyega in as Kang. I'm all for it, but uh, it's just a, it's sad and you know it's sometimes... a very sad, s- sticky situation that I give a lot of PR. This is where I give a lot of credit to PR teams. Like, you know, they try to do the best that they can. And if the best thing is to letting go of your artist or your client, then they're doing the right thing. Because knowing it took them like this long to figure out all the puzzle pieces, there's stuff obviously going on behind the scenes that we do not totally know. And we'll maybe never know. Because they're like, we did everything we can. And we can no longer go through fixing your mistakes or what your doings are so it's a it's it's not looking good from what i see damn but on a happier note let's talk about something a little bit happier um moving on we are in this live action sphere of disney so we are continuing to pump it out with the live action because we got peter pan coming out uh later on at the end of april Damn. and now yeah uh, i haven't seen any sign of promotion for this film for uh peter pan it's not looking good david lowry oh no man but we are now going into also the little mermaid and also lilo and stitch so they have announced that the Emmy and Tony Award winner Courtney B. Vance has joined the cast of Disney's live action Lilo and Stitch as the role of Cobra Bubbles. Bubbles. I'm so excited. I thought this was a really great casting choice. I thought Bubbles was going to be a girl. That's what I heard. They were going to gender swap, but I guess that was a false report. Yeah, I, I, I love, I love Courtney B. Vance and knowing that he was going to be, knowing I learned this morning that he was going to be a part of it. Because, well, first of all, they announced that the first casting announcement was going to be that uh, John, not Jonathan, Zach, Gal- Zach Galvanakis was going to be in the film. And it, it's from what I hear, he's p- playing Peakley, which I don't see him as. I could see him as Bub- uh, Jumba. Jumba. Yeah, yeah, Jumba. Jumba. And I was like, why isn't he Jumba? But I don't know. Maybe he gave a really interesting audition for Peakley. But Courtney V. Vance is. Cobra Bubbles, I'm here for it. Love it. Probably my favorite casting choice so far. Uh, Mac, what do you think of the so far casting of Lilo and Stitch? And are you uh, ready? I for... don't care. 
<laughs> it's not surprising to me. Well, I don't. Why are we doing live action? I don't give a shit. Like, I know. Cool, cool. Especially like the f- Ving Rhames should be bubbles. Like, I mean that, or like Etrius Elba too. Something like. But I like I Courtney not, B. Vance. I like I, Courtney B. Vance too, but it's just like, come on. And then actually, I did hear people were mad about who they got to play uh, uh, Nani. Was it Nani? Is his name? No, I, I think it was David's boyfriend. I think they might have been a little mad about. No, it was it was the sister they were mad at. These she's are all they, upcoming actors. No, so. they were mad because she's not dark enough to play the sister. That that's what I read. So it was like colorism in that, like a lot of people in the um is of uh, Polynesian descent. They're like, oh, it's not the right right one. Well, she's Hawaiian, right? Yeah. Well, isn't it like every like skin tone very different depending well, you know, on how you are? It's Twitter. But what do you expect? I'm still here for this movie, but I'm still very hesitant and very nervous. So, uh, moving on. Let's go to another good story. Mac, give us your next story. So, as I can pull it up right here, um, Adam Driver has been rumored to be the cast as as Reed Richards for the 2025 Fantastic Four movie. This is the highly anticipated uh, MCU debut for the Fantastic Four, and this comes off the report saying that uh, Adam Driver has been meeting with the uh, Marvel reps to maybe get a deal going and Kristen could you see Adam Driver as um Reed Richards I'm just shocked that Adam Driver would want to touch Marvel because he's in that realm of like working with like the top directors and a lot like Martin Scorsese and you know Marty's not a fan of Marvel you know that yeah so uh you know, and Leonardo DiCaprio is like, oh, I stay away from being all those superhero movies. Man. Listen, every actor says that, but if it's the pay pays good enough, they'll do at least one. Yeah, they'll at least do one. And I'm sure if Leonardo DiCaprio didn't have his time messing around with all the 25 year olds, he would be starring in a <laughs> uh, Marvel movie. Um, Adam Driver and anything is an A in my book. So if he's in Marvel, then I support. Do you think that? If he gets, because um, I will also double this up, is that James Gunn uh, Superman Legacy movie is in pre-production and that they're not uh, opposed to casting an older actor to play Superman. So who would you want to play Superman in James Gunn's new Superman movie? Oh, 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 um, oh. Can I just make a joke and say, can we bring back Nick Cage? <laughs> that would be funny. That's like, it could be like, it could be like a, it could be, um, like a oh, what's the word? It could be like a fulfilling prophecy because yeah. it's the legacy of Superman. The joke of it all. But uh, no, on a serious note, uh, ooh, it's so hard because, you know, I was so adjusted to Henry Cavill. And then now we, it's uh, Tyler Hecklin from uh, Teen Wolf, who is now, you know, Superman on TV. But I still picture like a young person portraying Superman. From what it's setting up to be, I, I do see it. I'm thinking of you know Sam Strike. Was that name some? I maybe I'm not sure. He's like been in a couple of things. Um, I'm gonna pull up his filmography stuff. He might he may not be the best casting choice, but I want somebody young and who has like could bring like a little something something to the project. But he mm-hmm. was in like um. Chernobyl, he was in uh, Where the Street Lights Go On, which was like one of the TV shows that I watched. He was in um, a movie called Monster Party. Mm-hmm. He was in Leatherface. He was Leatherface. Oh, I like him. Okay, now I don't even know what you're talking about. I like Leatherface. And he's going to be starring in a film called The Boys in the Boat with uh, Joel Edgerton. And it's directed Ooh. by George Clooney. Um. Ooh, though. <laughs> I don't know. I want somebody like who's in their like mid twenties and ready to go into these action movies, not where they're like freaking like forty. Because you know James Gunn, James Gunn is gonna be like, no, we gotta pump these out, and the actor is gonna be like sixty by the time they're gonna work on the fifth film, and he's gonna be like, guys, I can't do this no more. So we need somebody like a young whippersnapper. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll we'll see because this, like I said, this is kicking off the new DC EU. Who would you? Who do you want? 
Um, honestly, I don't know. It'll probably be like so because James Gunn liked to use a lot of the same actors he uses. So I wouldn't be surprised if he already has someone in mind. We just don't know yet. Somebody, if he's going to use the same actors, I wonder if that's going to be somebody from like the Suicide Squad. I'm thinking that's probably it. We get somebody like a Joel Kinnam- Kinnam- Kinnaman. Joel Kinnaman. 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 Kinnaman? Kinnaman? Yeah. Because we well, had a lot like, of people, a lot of people from Marvel, they said, like, I'll jump shit to go to DC to because the Russo brothers said they'll direct a the movie. Chris Pratt says he wouldn't mind directing, you know, being in something. Uh, Dave Batista says he wouldn't mind being in a DC movie. And uh, who else? Oh, um, Frank Grillo was just casted as someone in one of his new movies in the DC universe. Yeah, it's he's like the an first animated Mar- project. Yeah. He's the first Marvel guy to jump from Marvel to DC. Yeah, which is huge, and uh, Marvel's gonna definitely be on their toes at this point. Like, oh, what are you gonna do now? Well, we gotta see what Flash happens too. So that's gonna be the big reset, and we got oh. Blue Beetle coming out in August. Oh, I'm shaking my hands when I hear the Flash. I'm like, Ugh. listen, the trailer looks good. I'm just gonna be like, you can root for any what everyone but the Flash, and hope the Flash dies violently. <laughs> oh my god. Oh, okay, but. <laughs> Um, but that's that's my new story. That's your new story. Okay, my new story. Um, and our I guess our final new story is yeah, it's gonna go into Daisy at uh, Daisy Ridley Jones. Oh, is it, oh, um, is this what I think it is? You may not realize it, but all right. So oh, my okay. last new story is that Daisy okay, okay. Go. Ridley's Sundance film, Sometimes I Think About Dying, has landed at Ollie Scope. And I'm surprised that Alisco picked up this film because I wasn't thinking it was going to be picked up by them, but it got picked up by them. I was thinking something like, you know, Bleecker Street or maybe like Searchlight picking up this film, but Alisco decided to pick up the rights or even Neon. I was thinking of maybe seeing them pick up this film, but no, uh, they have not announced a released it yet, but it is directed by Rachel Lambert and stars Daisy and has a cast that I'm not too familiar with, but it stars Brittany O'Grady, Marisha Dinos, and yeah. So uh, Lambert gave a statement that says, I am thrilled that this film I love so much and was created with so much care by our team has found its home with Ollie Scope. Their legacy precedes, precedes them. Every time I see their logo pop before a film, I can rest assured that I am about to watch something artful and moving, knowing that the stand will proceed a film I directed with is a real honor. I look so forward to sharing. Sometimes I think about dying with audiences, and there is no release date as of yet. Like I said, so uh, Mac, are you gonna watch Daisy's new film, or are you just gonna? What the hell is o- Oscar? I've never heard of Ollie Scope. Yeah, I've never heard of them. They're like a smaller um, distributor company, so uh, they've have released a couple of uh, like films, like. Uh, we need to talk about Kevin. They re- one of their latest features is Sirens. Uh, I'm pulling up some of their photography now. So, I, I, well, you know, I hope that this movie does well. Daisy Ridley, I feel like she's a good actress. She just got shafted by uh, Star Wars, but hey, she's coming back to Star Wars. So if this doesn't do work out, she has something to fall back on. Yeah, uh, Ollie Scope has also released a uh, Saint Francis VHS. Um, where is it? Sophie Jones, Miss Purple, We Are Little Zombies, um, and a couple of other other small independent films that are pretty good. And, oh, one of them being their most popular is The Love Witch. But yeah, that's my final news story. And I think we should move on to the news and talk about Scream. Yes, we should. Let's do this, shall we? Oh, and finally, if you have any news stories that you want to share with us, send them on over to our Instagram pages or email us at the MK Productions Podcast Gmail. He followed us here. So what are we doing now? This isn't like any other ghost face. It's for you. Hello, Gail. Scream, only in theaters March 10th. All right, guys, we are going into the world of Scream, and we are about to head into not Wordsboro, but New York as our New news. York. 
Ghostface killer. Okay, 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 Glee. Let's move on. No, Alicia Keys. Don't you ever say that again? But yes, it is. But that's what they sang in the when they were going to New York. If you watch Glee, who watches Glee? I'm joking. But yeah, no, we're the Scream. Yeah, Scream, Scream Six, uh, starring Jenna Ortega, Melissa Barrera, Mason Gooding, Tier, and Courtney Cox. Yeah, my crush. Aw. Okay, Matt, give us the rundown of what the new Scream movie is about. So, Scream 6 takes place a year after the events of Scream 5 with, um, what's her, these characters' names? Okay. With uh, Sam and her sister, Tara, Tara uh, Carpenter, played by Melissa Barra and Jenna Ortega, respectively, they move away to New York City from Woodsboro. They bring along uh, Mindy Meeks and Chad Meeks. Uh, they go to New York just to try to live their lives and, you know, attend college and everything. But a recent string of new killings has them be fighting for their lives in the Big Apple while trying to get some help from some old friends a.k.a. Kirby Reed, a survivor from the 2011 Woodsboro Killings, a.k.a. Scream 4, and Gail Weathers, a.k.a. Courtney Cox, the OG of the group. So pretty much this is um, a new city, kind of the same type of situation. Like we have Ghostface killing people and trying to figure out who it is. We got the red herrings. We got the twists. We got the turns. We got some unexpected deaths, fake out deaths. And uh, yeah, uh, when you think about it, this is just another Scream movie. And when you want to really think about it this is just scream 2 but it's just a different form in a different location my god yes and i will say it scream 6 was fucking boring <laughs> i i enjoyed it but i loved the fifth one more the yeah. more i thought about it and i enjoyed the villains more in that one because i was on the talking tv podcast discussing it and I there was stuff I liked about this film and did I still have fun absolutely I loved seeing everything that involved the city um you know they didn't really do the most perfect job of like using New York as it's like what is it I can't think of the word it didn't use the setting location yes it's yes that's the word that's what I was trying to say yeah they didn't it didn't you utilize the city a hundred percent, but they were filming it during COVID, so I'm sure they had, you know, to work what they work with whatever they had. But does that mean I still had fun? Absolutely. Even though I feel like people were turned away by this film once we find out who the killers are. Yeah, no, that's what and, I was like. I checked out. Yeah, and I think that's what let down the disappointment <laughs> because I I liked we get not one, not two. But three ghost faces. So, <sighs> which I thought was really exciting, but then you figure out, like, oh. It uh, literally is just Scream 2, like, legit. Like, it's not even like, was it? Wait, hold up. Let me, let me make sure. But you keep talking. I'm going to make sure. I was going to say, but uh, the acting here, I will say, is better. But the everyone was complaining about the actors who were who were the killers but i enjoyed you know i'm gonna give some credit i enjoyed um who our killers were because we're gonna spoil it because it's been out for a little bit our killers in the film are oh jack champion who was just in avatar and linda liberato dermot maloney i want to call him baloney because i can't even say it properly and i apologize so what did you think of our killers? Because that's the most important thing. Did you think they excelled? No, not, really, not really, no. It's no. literally it's literally just, if you think about it, because the second one was like, oh, it was Mickey, and then it turns out it was Billy's mom. And no, this way, it's kind of the same, because the killers are related to Dennis, I mean, Jack Quaid from the fifth movie. It's their brother and sister. It's a whole family fan. Oh, stupid. I'm like, oh my god. I liked, you know, at least the father continuing on with the legacy of it, but then it's like, it how did he get away because... with some of this stuff as well, the cop in the film? Well, just that's like, because he's he's a cop, he can cover it up. Like, okay, so Linda, Liber uh, Lena, what did I call her? Linda. <laughs> Lena Liberato is killed at one point at the very beginning of the film, 
and you wonder how the heck how did she like escape that her body was like there and somehow they were able to get the body out in time can we just talk about samara weaving was like the notable celebrity to die in the beginning yes and they oh my god her, that was great i remember that they hyped her up as like being a big role and then she died immediately yeah which i was like i was disappointed that she died in the beginning but then not we had not one death but two deaths because we had um what you call it we had tony what's his what's his last name tony 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 oh tony rivari yeah tony rivari how you say yeah, it? rivari whatever he's from the grand budapest hotel i knew that was him because he looked so so much hair yeah he's got a lot of hair yeah he was uh the one that died too that was kind of funny yeah because he was like set up he was gonna be probably be our you know our ghost face if he didn't die in the beginning you know because everybody's continuing on the legacy that uh richie left yeah which okay I kind of like that and richie does make a great presence in the film and knowing that this is always gonna haunt you know um sam and tara for the rest of their lives you know there's no going away from this and knowing that this is now their new legacy of being part of this you know story Mm -hmm. and know richie that like because you know there's the people that are like oh they're rooting for richie but no he was a serial killer he was not our hero you know in any sorts but no some people see him as the hero and you know it's 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 an interesting take but yes. Screw everyone else. We got Hayden Penetieri back, the best character. Kirby Reed, she survived. They fulfilled Wes Craven's wish because he said if he ever made another movie, Kirby would have survived. And it was hinted at that she survived in the fifth movie. And she's back. She's an FBI agent. And I'm like, she, yes. She yes. excelled in every single every single moment in this film. I was like, girl, yes. This is why I love you and your character. And her and Jasmine, Jasmine Savoy together Oh my gosh, the scene where they're talk they're geeking out about the horror movies and they're testing each other on their knowledge. I love uh, that scene. I love that scene. Dude, I love she, the- she's her character is really good. I actually really like her. T- her character is like one of the best in the entire franchise, I must say. They really did a good job using her. They didn't, you know, it's not like it wasn't like a one-two punch cameo. No, they fully utilized her character and they made her character grow and stronger than ever. You know, it showed that like her character grew from what her what her friend did to her, and she became this really like badass FBI agent. And it's like, okay, yeah, well, and it's go. Because like, if you think about it, her character was very like feisty, but she was the fun feisty in the fourth yeah. movie. And yeah, she still had that same charm and feist- feistiness to her. So, which was great. And so, but I liked her character the most. She's like really cool. And I'm a little sad that Jasmine Brown didn't really have a lot to do like she did in the fifth one i liked her character as mindy she was pretty much like the female version of uh, jamie kennedy's character in the fifth one that's why i yeah. loved her so much and i felt like she didn't really do that much with this and can i just say in my opinion the setting of new york kind of killed the film for me uh i yeah that's what i was saying like because new york is so big it's very mm-hmm. hard to utilize i think sometimes in films well like, i get what they mean i get the, what they mean by it because like with a lot of the stuff you see in New York, a lot of people would probably just like walk by and like, yeah, whatever. Like the part when like the subway scene and then uh, Mindy got stabbed. I'm like, you're telling me no one would see that or like even hear her like muffled scream like that, like in a subway car. Really? Yeah. That or like nobody put the connection together of like knowing who's not just that, but like the only person who knew like we could tell who the killer was right away was like a the cop and his like kids because uh, remember when like uh melissa has a therapist yeah she only tells him that like she sees a therapist and tells him his name yeah i was gonna say that's another complaint i've heard with people in movies that like you can guess the killers easily it's not like the other movies where you don't know who they are like this one i think out of old school movies this one was probably the most obvious who the killers were yeah i guess we could say with that because at least with the fifth movie, you kind of had some suspicion what it was, and then it kind of shocked you at the end here. Like, well, one of them did, but the other one you were didn't really expect it with Dennis Quaid's character, or Jack Quaid's character. Yeah. And I will say it's not as bad as, like, it being when it was, like, Sydney's brother. Like, 
you know, half brother, whatever the hell that was. Like that. Oh, was... Billy, and Billy's mom. Yeah. No, it... no, not in the sequel, but oh. the third one. Oh yeah, well the third one sucks. That's the worst one. Yeah, so it's not like that bad, but it's still like. Oh, well, the yeah. thing is, it's just like this one felt. Okay, first of all, I'm gonna say it like this: having no Nev Campbell, this movie I think really killed it. <laughs> I don't think it totally kills it. It, sh- it just means that like it, she is like a central part to it and that she is missed, but I still missed her in it. But they, they I it, like they wrote her off like, oh yeah, her family went to hiding. Yeah. I'm they like, did. And I'm like, I, oh. I mean, I guess it's better than killing her off because they did say they want to bring her back for another movie. And I kind of yeah, if and they then, raise her pay, then she'll come back. And then they almost killed Courtney Cox, which I saw the trailer, I'm like that's ballsy that you yeah. try to do that because yeah. she's the only one left from the original movie yeah well they know they're gonna do like a final one even though they didn't announce it yet they're, they're we're gonna get another movie at some point it's just yeah. probably gonna need some more time because jenna ortega is like the hottest you know actress at the moment and uh, melissa Barrera is starring in another horror project yeah, yeah universal monsters with uh, radio silence so, you know, yeah like... that and she's also starring like in a musical horror movie hmm so she's got some stuff lined up and I'm sure, you know, Mason Gooding's got some stuff. So everybody's a little busy. I'm sure Hayden's ready to go back into it because I would love to see her, not just in this, but another horror movie in general because she's really good in horror. I think after seeing her in this again, uh-huh. she just knows how to excel in horror movies. So I'm I... all for that, for her joining another horror project. I think my biggest problem with Scream 6, though, I'd say, is that they don't commit on killing anyone. Because they even said in this one, they're following the rules of the horror franchise, where in this one, everyone, anyone can die. So and when it, I, knowing, no one died. Yeah, well, knowing maybe. how far Mason was stabbed in all of those times, I was like, he survived again? Like, was I happy Kirby, he survived? Like, absolutely. But I was like, Kirby got shot. Was, Got, Kirby got shot and stabbed. She's fine. Gail got stabbed and bled out, but she's fine. Mason got stabbed, like uh, repeatedly got fine. Mindy got stabbed a few times like, deep in the gut and survived. Jenna fell on somebody. Melissa <laughs> fell and like hit her head and she survived. Like no one is dying. Like the only girl that died was literally Dewey. I feel bad. Yeah, that was in the last film. Yeah. That's a legacy like, character. Like no one really died because like come on you can't just say oh they're following the rules like anyone can die in the franchise I'm like that's just a bad that's just an excuse to like do the marketing because i remember when the trailer came out i was like oh, courtney cox is gonna die and i bet you that's what people were going well i guess that's good to have that conception and then it can shock you but like, oh, yeah, she's the anticipation fine. for it but still it's just like uh, it was so like just stick to your guns if you're going to do like we're gonna kill off the characters like don't pussy out go for it can we stop this two ghost face killer stuff like i'm so sick of like that two killer stuff do you want like five ghost face do... no can we just do one like i know the reason why they do two is like oh how can ghost face be here and the other and here so quickly and the fact that like the part that took me out was the convenience store scene when this man was holding a shotgun I'm like there's no way ghost face would ever use a gun yeah, and he used the gun. And he used like, the gun. I'm like, wait, what? Like, that is not Ghostface's MO at all. I was so shocked. I mean, I, that, you know, that was seen like in the uh, trailer itself. I was like, wow, they like, he's changing the game. It's funny for me, like, um, I feel like Scream 5 had a terrible trailer, but it was really good. Well, Scream 6 had a good trailer, and the movie was just okay for me. I, I here's the other thing too like I enjoyed a lot of it too but uh the more I think about it now the more I'm like I love like the other Scream films uh-huh. like four and even two sometimes so my question is what would you want them to do in a Scream 7 in a Scream which 7 pro- which will probably be the end which will probably be the end okay so I would want them to wrap a lot of things up in a pretty little bow and then i would like to see it if and i would be shocked if they decide to make one of the original characters a ghost face killer which would be so insane like what like nev campbell was like well, no not nev campbell because nev would uh, never do it 
No. no. She would never be a ghost face killer. No, she knows like it. Courtney Cox or something? No. Uh, no, but in one of the new kids, but like Mindy or Chad, but, you know, or even Tara, be a ghost face killer. I want them to like, you know, there's a rumor that they might bring back Matthew Lillard. Uh, that would be nuts. Like, but I would be like, how did he, he survive? Maybe like he, they revived him. He just went, he just reformed. Cause I, I would like, I liked his character, and I think Matthew Litter, he's yeah. done a lot of like stuff to like we. I wouldn't mind having him back. Here's what I think: if he does well in Five Nights at Freddy's, mm-hmm. then they could bring him back. Oh, they bring him back as a new character, but he's like, "Wow, you look a lot like like Stu." Stu's twin. Yeah, I was like, oh, I was. Okay. It's Lou. It's <laughs> it's but Lou. Scream Six was fine. I feel like when it came to like my most anticipated movies this was in it because the fifth one was really good and it i was had so good really, was i had no ex- favorites maybe maybe because i didn't have any expectations for it that, that i loved it more because i didn't think it was gonna be that good or maybe it's because this one i feel like i've already seen it because in like i said this feels like scream 2 yeah um but yeah uh i don't really have anything else to say about scream <laughs> Yeah, I mean neither. Like, uh, I mean, well, the direction you know, I think was still good. The oh yeah, no silence. Ray, there, there's nothing with the direct. I think it's more just the story. Just like I feel like this is just a same movie, just with a different coding on because, it. Because um, Radio Silence did not write the film this time. So oh yeah, that's true. It was written by James Vanderbilt and Guy Busick. Yeah, so uh, I don't which, know why they decided not to write it which if I you're wondering where they both run uh, james vanderbilt vanderbilt is known for writing zodiac the amazing spider-man and the, the 2014 amazing spider-man 2 independence day he wrote scream and he also wrote white house down i hate white house down all right but knowing he wrote also independence day resurgence does not also sit well with me he also did losers which is actually a underrated movie but you know independence like- day it's amazing how he went from writing the screenplay to Zodiac, then going to like... Like, I don't know what happened. There's but just it, like all this weird well, let, winding roads. Well, let's face it, Zodiac was more of a David Fincher movie. So I'm assuming yes. David Fincher heavily edited that script. And then he just, and then he also based, he was like one of the murder mystery too. He said, it says on his IMDb, based on the characters created by and written by... Uh-huh. And, and I forget, just watched Murder Mystery 2, and that was god awful. Hey, don't forget, he did the both amazing. <laughs> Spider- <laughs> he did both amazing Spider-Man movies, which are terrific. Just yes. Spider-Man movies, Spider-Man 2, am I right? But yeah, um, if you watched the Scream Six, let us know. Uh, I gave it when I reviewed it a B plus. So I give it a six and a half out of ten. Yeah, but still not as good as uh last one but maybe now i think about it more maybe i'm going towards b all right guys um let us know what you like i said what do you let us know if, what you think of six uh let us know is nev campbell gonna return for scream seven let us know in the comments down below or message us all righties now let's get on to our final topic and that is our favorite movies of the year so far as we wrap up our f- episode 101 zoe 101 mm-hmm. yeah that you know that show is kind of canceled at this point uh Anyways, we're going to talk about our favorite films so far we have seen this year. And Mac, would you like to kick us off on your five favorite films you've seen so far this year? All right, so five favorite films I've seen this year in no particular order, even though it's one of the, you know, everything. So I will say it has been Missing, Plain, Megan, Cocaine Bear, and John Wick Chapter 4. And then a special honorable mentions to Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, because that movie probably is... Tied with Megan for being a surprise hit of the year for me. Okay. Uh, we have somewhat similar things going on here. But I'm going to acknowledge at the moment uh, the fil- the following films. Sick of Myself, Shazam, even though people do not, did not love it. I had it fun was, with it. Yeah, I thought I it was it. good. I thought it was good. It had a good stamp of approval for me. A Little Prayer, which I saw at Sundance. Aliens abducted my parents, and now I kind of feel left out. Another film I saw at Sundance, and The Starling Girl, which is going to come out on May 12th. And I saw that at Sundance. But my top five movies of the year so far 
are the following. Renfield, Infinity Pool, um, Scream 6, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, and my number one favorite so far this year is John Wick Chapter 4. Good, good, good. Yeah, it's kind of torn between that one and How to Blow Up a Pipeline as my favorite film of the year so far. So mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed both of those films. Like, if I'm going to give, like, an A's films, like, those are the two I'm going to give out A's. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, but guys, this has been our episode. Uh, next episode, we are going to talk uh, the Mario movie with Chris Pratt. Yeah. Mamma Mia. Yeah. Mamma Mia is that a movie, and it's becoming the number one movie of the year so far. Mario is saving the box office. It's setting the bar for video game movies, too. It's been pretty mixed so far, but people have been having fun with it. And that's what we got to have sometimes. Fun up the movies. Alrighty, guys. That has been it. We will catch you next time. Oh, don't forget to follow us on our socials. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And stay up to date with us. And we will see you all next time. Peace. Bye.